חוסיין פחי אל חלדי הוא זה לידר אוף זה ערב של ג'רוזלם, פרסט אופל אידינט נו וואט רילי הפן זה. הנה הוא פלט ביי רומרס. So he decided to invent the story about 254 people killed. However, if he was just enlarging the number of people killed, it was still tolerable. However, he decided to add stories of rapes. Now this was the fact that caused the collapse of the Arab military effort in Jerusalem and then later in the entire of Palestine. Because as many of the Palestinians that I read the, inter the interviews, they said we were willing to fight, we were not willing to risk, to have the risk that our uh, women will be raped by the Jews. And we decided in instead of uh, fighting against the Jews to give up and to flee. <laughs> so eventually, because of the story of Dir Yassin, we know nowadays that the number of refugees increased 10 times after the event of Dir Yassin. About 60,000 people left Palestine, those, uh, Palestine, how it was called in those days, before the event of Dir Yassin, and between the event of Dir Yassin and the establishment of the State of Israel just in about five weeks, the number was six times higher, and eventually ten times higher. And it was because of the story of Dir Asin. The Palestinian Authority carried out massive uh, interviews with survivors of Dir Asin in the late 1990s, with, so, sorry, with survivors of, the, of Palestine in general in the late 1990s, and about 97% of them said that they were impacted by what they believed happened in Dir Asin. So, Basically, what we have here is a story not just of Dir Yassin itself. It was just a middle-sized village. It was just a story of Dir Yassin. It was not so important. But because of the rumors, false rumors spread about Dir Yassin by the Arab leaderships, basically, the Palestinians decided to flee Palestine. About six to 700,000 Palestinians. And this is why the story of Dir Yassin is so important. First of all, that there was no massacre at all just a 10-hour battle during which 100 Palestinians were killed during the battle. I know each one of them, how exactly he was killed. I have a table in the book saying each one of them, how exactly, because I had so many in, uh, testimonies from people for the Yassin that I could trace as exact circumstances of, circumstances of death of each of the people killed there, all of them. So first of all, there was no massacre, and secondly, the so-called massacre was a be, uh, one of the major reasons for the Palestinian flight in 1948, which gave the Dir Yassin story its importance. Now, later on, the Palestinians realized, the Palestinian leadership realized the disaster that it caused its own people. And I managed to find an interview with this assistant of uh, Hussein Fakhri al-Khaldi, he was called Hazem Nusseiba, later on he was, for, he was a foreign minister in Jordan. The, the, uh, Khaldi himself was a prime minister in Jordan later on, and the, his assistant in 48 was a foreign minister in Jordan, and he gave an interview to a British network, and then, I mean, you know, it is an interview in TV, I, I was interviewed for uh, Channel 2 for three hours, and then you have two, two three minutes uh, in the Hadashot. Yeah. But, so therefore, when I, when, I, when I saw this interview with Hazem Nuseiba, just two minutes interview, I said, I must see the typescript. And I managed to see how, where they were, the, the, everything was archived in, in, uh, in Oxford, and I took a trip to Oxford, and he, then I managed to find a 32-page interview with this Hazem Nuseiba, telling the entire story. He said, we caused a disaster to our people by inventing the myth of Dir Yassin. Wow. So this is basically the story of the book about what happened, what really happened in Dir Yassin and the impact that it had on the Palestinian flight and how actually it was all caused by the Palestinian leadership. And those who research it from the Palestinians themselves, they know the truth. And the, the interviews that I managed to read from the uh, documents that I got from the Palestinian Authority, they, they knew the truth. But of course, later on, what could they do? I mean, saying that uh, as, as this interview, top interview, Palestinian interview said, so the Israelis are innocent of this uh, blame. 
I mean, they cannot say it in public. You can say it in 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 a, in, a, in a document archived in the Palestinian Authority, which I managed to uh, to to get a copy of. So this is basically, I'm on time. You were perfect. Right? So this is basically <laughs> the story of Dir Yassin. <coughs> if anyone is willing to ask me question about it later on, I think later on, yep. later on, after the, all the <laughs> panel will have his chance to speak, then I will be more than glad to answer questions. Is that good? Okay. Far away from me as possible. Okay. Sorry. Yes, I have to stand. All right. Can you stand up? Can you introduce him? He wants to introduce himself. Oh, yeah. We, we so, so my name is Richard Landis. Can I try this without? Yes, okay. Let me try. So my name is Richard Landis. Can, can people in the back can hear? Yeah, they can hear. You can't hear? <laughs> you can't hear what I'm saying? No, no. All right. <laughs> Okay. How's that? All right. Is that better? Okay, now you can hear me? I can hear <laughs> Okay, so uh, my name's Richard Landis. I was a medieval history professor and in the last two decades of the 20th century I spent my time in medieval archives in Europe, and then the Antifada hit. And uh, <coughs> as a result, uh, my career got somewhat sidetracked, and I've just published this book, which is the basically the product of those investigations into what happened. So um, I retired in 2015. Yeah, can I, I wish I could just say that that is the last book I read before the tragedy happened to my family on April 7th. I was bringing it up to uh, Daria for my son to read and my nephew is a new read to read. I recommend everybody read that book. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. That's Lee, Leo D. Um, so, uh, enough of the introduction. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is uh, the sort of key term in this title, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? lethal journalism, anti-Semitism, and global jihad, uh, the key word, at least for my talk now, is lethal journalism, uh, which is something that, it, it, you know, it existed before when Israel invaded uh, Lebanon in 1982. There was Dan Rather standing there with Beirut behind him, comparing it to the Warsaw Ghetto. So, you know, there was this uh, sort of stick it to Israel attitude, but it didn't... To Hitler. Yeah. But it didn't get anywhere near the kind of consensus that emerged after 2000. After 2000, more or less across the boards, um, the news was basically processing Palestinian war propaganda as news. And the most extraordinary example was the one that got me involved in this whole process, namely the story of Muhammad Abdullah, the 12-year-old boy behind the barrel, who was shot by the Israelis, targeted, according to Charles Andelin, who I hope sues me, um, <laughs> targeted by a fire coming from the Israeli position, which he later admitted in an interview in Haaretz with Adi Schwartz, uh, when Adi Schwartz said, maybe you were a little uh, you know, premature in making this claim. And he said, what would they have said in Gaza if I didn't say the Israelis targeted him? And that part of the interview was removed from the English version. It only appears in the Hebrew version. Thanks to camera for, ca no for catching that. What? No surprise. Yeah, no surprise there. Okay, so... Um, 
So I define lethal journalism, it's, well, let's start with patriotic war journalism. Patriotic war journalism is when you report your own side's propaganda as news. And basically any government that goes to war wants reporters to tell the story the way they want it told. And m the modern press is particularly proud of resisting that temptation. So, for instance, in 1991, the Bush administration, Bush Sr., uh, arranged to have a young girl who was actually the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador um, tell the story of, you know, the Iraqis coming in and throwing babies on the floor and letting them die when they invaded Kuwait. And that was a very important turning point. And it turns out the whole story was made up. And, but the press was very quick to denounce this and so on. So patriotic war journalism in modern professional journalism is a no-no. Now, in principle, lethal journalism should be too. Lethal war journalism is when you're covering somebody else's conflict and you take sides and report one side's war propaganda as news. And that overwhelmingly is what the mainstream legacy news media did starting with the outbreak of the Intifada in 2000. Now there's a third kind of war journalism, which I call own goal war journalism, in which you report your enemies, your own enemies' war propaganda as news. And there's a real question as to how long any society can survive when its information professionals are basically feeding it as verified information, and this includes academics, uh, can survive with this kind of own goal war journalism. And I'll, I'll give you just one example of that own war, war, goal war journalism. In 2002, when the news, the journalists who had not been anywhere near <laughs> Jenin refugee camp were reporting massacres of hundreds of people. Um, there were huge demonstrations in Europe protesting this Nazi-like behavior, uh, including in London. I won't go into all the details, but one detail really caught my eye, which was in Madrid there were models who came out to demonstrate in support of the Palestinians wearing nothing but two mock suicide belts. Now, there they were cheering on their own society's enemies. Within two years, the trains in Madrid would get blown up. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Brits. So that's a good illustration of on war journalism. There are even more extreme, but I'll stick with that one. So the, the situation is, how do I explain to myself, to my readers, why this lifted up. Oh, geez. Um, why this own goal war journalism has been so successful. So I think the first explanation, and I think it's something that we really need to, really needs to be emphasized because it's a public secret, and that is that the Palestinians have intimidated Western journalists. In a sense, the Western journalists are vimy to the Palestinians. The Palestinians are vimy to us, and we are vimy to the foreign press. In all cases, what you have is a very unhealthy relationship. So first of all, there's intimidation, and my favorite example is in 2014, during the Gaza operation, during the Eid al-Fitr uh, truce, the Hamas broke the truce and shot four rockets at Israel, one of which landed on a refugee camp right near Shati refugee camp and killed 10 kids. Immediately, the Western press ran in to tell the story of how the Israelis mercilessly broke a truce and killed these 10 kids. The media knew it was a fake, but they didn't say it. And one Italian journalist, upon leaving Gaza, said, far from Hamas intimidation, 
Strike at Shakti refugee camp last night, Hamas. Proof they came in and took away all the debris. So, at this point, the uh, the Foreign Press Association here, which loves to talk about Israeli intimidation of Palestinians and doesn't mention uh, the intimidation of uh, the Palestinian intimidation, actually came out with a statement in which they complained about Hamas intimidation of journalists. Jody Rudorn, the then correspondent for the New York Times, tweeted out, every reporter that I've talked to from Gaza tells me that this stuff about Hamas intimidation, this Israeli now Foreign Press Association narrative is ridiculous. Nonsense. She said nonsense. So it, that's a really good example. I got five minutes. Okay. That's a really good example of the intimidation. But the intimidation doesn't explain the sort of mm, the, the, the verve of many of these journalists. And there, my explanation is what I call moral schadenfreude, which is it really seems to msamech et alev shel goyim that we are behaving badly. There is an appetite for news of Jews behaving badly, and as a medievalist, I think it goes back to supersessionist claims. In other words, my father, Allah Shalom, used to say to me many times, which just lets you know how hard it is to learn this lesson, you don't make yourself look bigger by making other people look smaller. Well, supersessionism is making yourself look bigger by making the Jews look smaller. And this appetite for news about Jews behaving badly, I think, is directly related to this unavowed competition between the progressive left and Israel. The progressive left does not want to recognize that Israel basically is a moral giant, certainly a moral giant in this region. And so um, I just published an article in Fathom, and as I was going over the, the last edits, I came to the end of a paragraph where I talk about the way in which progressives deny that Israel behaves well at all. So I'm sure you've heard of pink washing. There's pink washing, there's purple washing, there's brown washing, there's all kinds of washing in which anything that Israel does that's good gets dismissed as a way to distract people from the mean things we're doing to the Palestinians. And it occurred to me as I, I put in a final sentence which the editor cut and I told him he could and he did. Um, but I've been thinking about it, which is it's almost as if progressives cannot acknowledge the things that Israel does that are good. Not only because it takes Israel off the hot seat where they feel good about it being, but also because they, I think what it what it would do if they were to acknowledge, for instance, if there were a Nobel Prize to the people who ran the medical aid that we give on the Syrian border, which I do think should get a Nobel Peace Prize, I think they feel that it would humiliate the Arabs and the Muslims. That the gap, the moral gap between Israel and the Arab world, and you can see it in the Deir Yassin story, the moral gap between what the Israelis do and what the Arabs do and would do is so great that it's really hard for people to even fathom it. And as a result, their easy out is to deny it. But the result of that denial is a Two minutes, I was just going to wind up. The result of that denial is literally a disorientation that is so enormous that the West is now in a situation where it is constantly making policy choices that are catastrophic for the West and fit right into 
the cognitive war that the jihadis are conducting. I call them caliphaters because they believe that in this generation there will be a global caliphate. The caliphaters are conducting worldwide and the Palestinians are conducting here. So I guess one of the things that argue in my book is until we understand this, until we realize just how <laughs> twisted this narrative that the West is consuming in by the gallon like fast food. I mean, in a sense, think of the America, the obese American, I'm one of them, but not a really obese American, <laughs> the obese American as a symbol of the gorging out on news of Jews behaving badly that makes him feel good but actually makes him look terrible. <laughs> and realize that as long as this appetite is being fed by people like Christian Alman poor at CNN, as long as it's being fed by that, and as long as nobody but the Jews say anything about it, and only some of the Jews, um, I would say the West is in very serious trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just had, um, uh, there's a map that I've drawn up, uh, had drawn up of the Middle East um, and the Freedom House uh, human rights scores for every country and the only green one is Israel because it's the only free country in the Middle East and all the red ones are all the Arab countries which have no freedom according to Freedom House which is the international standard for measuring uh, human rights in the Middle East. This map will come out hopefully with my article on Friday in the Jerusalem Post which is an open letter to David uh, Zaltzman, whatever his name is, the guy from CNN, uh, and uh, that Zaltzman, what's his name, uh, which basically challenges him to change his whole policy towards Israel. So, uh, please, please buy the, please buy the, uh, the Jerusalem Post on Friday. Um, okay, so just before the next speaker, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, it's important uh, to note that we have water, if you go there, around, to the left and then to the right. And there's also a restroom there, okay? So that's just for everyone. We could also use some water. So I'll bring you, I'll bring you all water. Uh, speaker is David Bedin. He's a MSW community organized, organizational social worker, professional, turned investigative journalist. He partnered with the, what is the Near East? Center for Near East Policy Research. Center for Near East Policy Research, and uh, uh, he wrote a book called Road, Road, Roadblock to Peace. Okay. Just take this, as far as possible. Let's see if you can answer. I'm a little fellow, but usually you can hear me. Can you hear me back there? But there's a lot of people in the back who can't hear. Oh, that's what we're not, being, we're not being sensitive to them. No problem. <laughs> All right. It's good to see everyone here. To sit next to Jonathan, I told him the first time I saw him, I cried because I was worried when I saw his legal stuff that I would never see him. And the day that he was convicted was the day that Danny Kay died. He was my hero in, 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 the, in, the, in, in comedy, and I couldn't, I couldn't mourn Danny Kay because of you. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, actually, in December '85, I saw the, transcri the transcripts of the of the legal cases against Sharansky and against Jonathan. I said, and I was you know newly religious, one of those Balchuba types. Would I ever see these guys in my lifetime? And to sit, I'm going to cry. Sit next to you. <laughs> In my life, I'm just like, wow. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? No. Okay. No. What, what, what? you got to change the direction. Well, someone, right? well, someone do something here. Turn it around. Yeah, I did something. Whatever I did, it was wrong. Turn it around. Sorry. Turn it around. Just go ahead. Try again. Okay. How's that? All right. Now, uh, can you hear me back there? Can you see me? <laughs> no, I was six foot six when I got married. <laughs> anyway, 52, 52 years ago I came to Israel. I was shaken up during the Six Day War. 
during the, uh, that great moment of, of Yerushalayim being taken, but even before that, maybe wouldn't have a Yerushalayim. I was kind of cynical about davening, and all of a sudden I davened. And I want to tell you, that the, the cataclysmic effects, that, the events that happened in the U.S. in the late 60s brought me here. The day I decided to come here was a CBS story, which had the CBS News, Walter Cronkite, that's the way it is. And uh, two, two items in May 1970. I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. I'm originally from Philadelphia. That's a West Bank settlement on the Delaware River. <laughs> anyway, East Bank. Well, anyway, I was I listened to Walter Cronkite. That's the way it is. A moment in my life which I'll never forget. Two and two news items. One is the admission that the Americans had killed 20,000 people in Cambodia, and the day, the massacre of Abivim. Most people forgot about it, and I never did, because later on, as a social worker in Spot, I worked with those families. And uh, Avivim was a uh, moshav in the north, and a school bus was attacked. And I know the way, with it, since I've been working with journalists for 36 years, I know how things happen that aren't planned to happen. A CBS reporter was on his honeymoon, and he had right near Avivim, and he got the story in real time, and he publicized that the Arabs got on the bus and killed 13 kids, each one uh, knocking, slitting their throats. I said, there's a country I can fight for, a country I can't fight for. And that was my statement at this student union at the University of Wisconsin. And a few months later, I was here for life. And there are many people who don't want to hear my message. My Rabbi Riskin says, don't, don't ask, on Shabbat, he says, don't ask David Bedin what's new, he might tell you. <laughs> and uh, the whole point of what I did in, as a social work investigator, I was influenced by a guy named Saul Alinsky, who was not a communist. He tried to, get, to be a voice for the people, and my dream was to do that in Israel. My first few years here, I was involved with uh, the Pantarim Shorim, the Black Panthers, and a few other groups that tried to bring issues of social justice to people's attention. I was involved with the starting of Pardes, a place that everyone could, could learn, whether you man, woman, or whatever. And uh, <laughs> it was really, you know, I've seen successes. But the a great moment here in Yerushalayim was when I discovered, and when I came back to Yerushalayim after six years in the spot, right over there, right over there, there was a, uh, the PLO, which was a terrorist organization and all that, they started something called Jerusalem Media Services. Taking, we're, we're ready to take journalists to see refugee camps, to see our people, to see our story. I said, these guys are doing an Alinsky on us. They're doing something smart. They're showing their human story. They're not just blowing people up. I mean, that's what they did, of course, in Beirut in, in, in 81. I mean, in, seven, in, in um, 82, they were, they were just you know, killing journalists right, right and left. There's a few books about that. But they decided to charm them and take them around and use what I, what I learned in social work, working both with Arabs and with Sephardim, that if you can, if you can charm people, you can say all kinds of things, and, get, and you can get away with it. You can get away with it. So that's what they were doing right, right up here. The P, uh, PLO had an office here. I decided what I'm going to do now, since my social work was falling, I wasn't getting able to get something uh, proper. So what I did was to start an agency to counter what the PLO was doing with the media. And the most important thing was to hear what they're saying in their own language. And what I know from day one in Israel is the Deir Yassin massacre, the Deir Yassin story. <coughs> they wanted to Deir Yassinize. It became a verb. <laughs> and and how, to, how, how to advance myths in real time. And the first evening of our, of our office, which was down here at Beta Grown, down at, the, down at the bottom of Hillel Street, first night we brought in Colonel Lapidot. Well, who was he? He was the commander at Darius Sina. I brought him to speak because he had come back from, from London investigating the, massacre, the, the story of the massacre from the British point of view. And we were able to coordinate something that countered all the, all the myths that had, had been publicized over the years, which I heard, and the, the headline we got in Reuters after he made his presentation was, British government documents, there was no massacre. The purpose of my work over the last uh, 36 years has been to produce, mass, uh, to produce uh, stories like that, <laughs> that, we, that, that we can reproduce, produce stories that can show the Jewish point of view without it coming necessarily from us. Finding Arabs who would be willing to speak. And today, 
uh, our agency, which is a combination of a research agency and a, so, and, and a news agency, we send Arabs to, to the scene to film. And tonight we're sending an Arab to, to the Arabs to the uh, 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 refugee camp where the killers of the D family came, came from. And they're starting a whole campaign which will go on all summer with summer camps devoted to, devoted to these murderers. Now, how to get that out? Well, we, 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 it's, it's a long, long and uh, dusty road, but we're going to do it. We've done it before, and we'll do it again. The idea is to show that when UNRWA is doing, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which is supposed to be a, re a temporary refugee camps, temporary since 1949, 19, uh, and the, the first refugee was, the camp was started in 49, and they've managed to create a myth that every child believes that his grandparents were kicked out, not only that, but his grandfather was, was murdered and his grandmother was, was uh, raped. But when did they begin the Nakba campaign? 1998. Mm. Now, I have a habit of going different places, which they don't always want me to be there, but I go there. There was something called the Orient House here in Jerusalem, the PLO, house, the PLO headquarters, and they, they invited me, that was their mistake, to come to their seminar on Nakba. Because they were afraid that the that the Arabs were going to believe in a West Bank Gaza state, and you know they what, what about you know as we would uh, we would say uh, are we you know, ch chopped liver? <laughs> so they started this whole campaign to renew the, the the Palestinian Authority education, and which became the new school books, and we got the school books eventually, but for, for my social work training, Mr. Arafat had one interview with Arafat. Mr. Arafat, when are you going to show your view of peace? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and this is his mistake, can you come and see my school books? Well, we've seen every school book. Uh, a friend of mine who's a reform rabbi offered us $10,000 to show any expression of peace in those Arabic school books. I said, well, I need the money, but my integrity <laughs> is more important. <laughs> now, this evening, and I don't know how we're going to pay it, I say openly we look to raise funds to do it. We're sending a crew to Akhtar camp. We're sending a crew to Akhtar camp to film the beginnings of their summer camp. Now, the summer camp is not organized by Arabs. It's organized by Germans, <laughs> F-Germans, okay? And the Germans are doing it together with the Brits, the Swedes, the Irish. They're the ones organizing this. Wow. Organizing so the, the kids, kids, they actually have what we, what we can see on our, our website, IsraelBehindTheNews.com, and we have another website, OnRaMonitor.com. You'll see exactly what they do. They they and they play act. They they, they, they they play act the whole business of the Girush, the the, the expulsion, um, 48, and they they relive, relive it over and over and over. And the hero of the camps is the killer of your of your family. And that we have to show that because in their charm campaign, in their charm campaign, they try to they try to show these are people who are suffering and all that, and that it's a very, very innocuous connection to the Nakba, which again was invented in 1998. And I'll go back. Let me go two things autobiographical. My grandfather was the head of the American Legion in New York, in in Long Island, and he worked together, believe it or not, with Charles Lindbergh, who was thought thought to be an anti-Semite. And they infiltrated the, the German-American Bund to try to see what they could do to destroy the Nazis in, in real time in, in the 30s in, in Long Island. And they, and they succeeded. They succeeded not because the Jewish organizations wanted them, because the Jewish organizations were being recruited to do what? To raise money for the, for the, for, to rebuild Germany as a way to, for peace. Their theme was, believe it or not, peace now. <laughs> now, uh, later on, the, in, in when the Eichmann trials happened, I sat next to my grandfather watching them very, very carefully and understanding what happened and what, 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 what could have happened and what, what, what Israel's all about. To remember the Eichmann trials and to keep the memory going. Last personal story, I got involved with this subject when I was a student in, in Madison with a great professor named George Mossy, people who knew him, an amazing guy. He, he, he survived, he, he, he uh, got out of Germany with his money, and he was a publisher, and he told us a story about Hitler in real time. The Hitler, at the very beginning of his, of his um, political career, he was running for chancellor, and he, he may have had a whistle stop campaign, and he was advised by a PR, a very famous PR firm, to, um, 
and I haven't been able to find documentary uh, documents of this, but but uh, George Bossy was very credible. He said the first thing you got to do is is make sure that Hitler is is petting the pictures of Hitler petting dog petting dogs and kissing children. That PR firm, according to George Bossy, was the, the Walt Disney. <laughs> Fairy tales can come true; they can happen to you. <laughs> anyway. When I had the interview with Arafat, and I, we made, what I did to upset the apple cart with Arafat, we, we had a crew filming him every place during the, uh, during the heyday of, the, of, the, of Oslo. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin told Rabbi Riskin that I was his greatest pain in the tuchus, <laughs> uh, to which I'm proud. Uh, because he said the, 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 what we did was, up, and there was going to be an investigation. Sometimes you get news stories that never happen. Because in con we, we, brought, we showed our films of Arafat in the uh, Congress, and uh, Ch Chairman Gilman of the Hi International Foreign, uh, Foreign Relations Committee said we're going to have an investigation of the, uh, the Israelis who were lying to us. And the investigation was supposed to begin on November 6th, 1995, two days after Rabin was murdered. So it never happened. So we've seen in our, our, our lifetime, the one thing that, that two, two quick things about Arafat. One is when I, when I met his spokesman before the interview, he said, you can trust him. He's only killed 12 people with his own hands. Uh, I, I felt really good. Uh, but uh, the other thing is I brought a person with, who was an expert on, on body language when we met Arafat. And he said, oh, please evaluate him. He said, if I didn't know who he was, who was I would say he was incapable of violence. What they well, pulled over on us and they, and they dare you seen, dare you seen the whole public as if there's an ongoing uh, Nakba, as if there's an ongoing crime. And uh, a, a, as the as Goebbels would have said, a lie repeated enough often enough becomes believable. So what we're trying to do, and we only operate with 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 uh, with uh, personal fund, with with private funds. The government of Israel had did everything possible to try to stop us. The current government is helping us a little bit. They're giving us, they're pat patting me on the head and saying, "We'll work with you." I said, "No, my tuchus, they'll work with me." Uh, <laughs> because what what the what PLO did was to, and I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm overstating my my time. What the PA has done, we have this on our site has been to many, many Jews, many businessmen here in Jerusalem and around the country, very wealthy, by uh, expanding the markets. And that's what, something we, wanna, we want to further um, study and publicize, how the, the um, investments in the PA have become a very, very important cottage industry for many, many Jews. And it's disgusting, and we have to stop it, even though, uh, I mean, I, I have uh, my own offers, but you know, my integrity is more important. But just many, many journalists know this. Everyone has this story. Every journalist that I know, and I work with the journalists, and I've also worked for CNN, CNN Radio, and uh, I know, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Everyone's afraid to publicize it in a, in a proper fashion. But that's what's going on. The purchase of journalists, the rental of journalists, and uh, how we fight back is with, with, human, with the human face. And, I, uh, and when you come into the office, uh, there's a picture, composite picture of 1,350 people murdered by the by the Arabs, and uh, the key thing that's not publicized anywhere, and we try to publicize it whenever we can, is that it's not only that Arabs are paid, pay, uh, Arabs pay money to killers, but there's an automatic, automatic um, uh, salary for life granted to anyone who murders a Jew. We got that document because the Arab workers who work for us got, got the document from the, from the uh, Palestinian Ministry of Justice. We have that document, and we've given it to every journalist, and I don't know what they're doing with it. All I know is that uh, we have to get the word out, and, and as, as, as I'm speaking today, because from our sources, the um, young man who was murdered yesterday in uh, Kermash, uh, his, his, the, 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 the word for his murderers is already being processed, and the deal is if you, if you, if you, su if you su survive the murder, you get the money. If, you're, if you don't, then your parents get the money. But the, when this is the system, and it's all justified, and I think the, there's an expression that my <coughs> professor Eliezer Jaffe used to t say, a problem is a problem when someone makes it into a problem. And this, this is what we have to do. I put out a, a one-pager if anyone wants to work with us. You're, you're invited to work with us. We have to win this battle. It's a battle, and there are enough journalists who we can win. We can, we can win on this. And uh, I'm so pleased that Rabbi Day sent a letter to the corporate section of CNN because they have to pay a price. Thank you. It's no introduction.
Jonathan Pollard, and he's going to be speaking about a new approach to foreign media. Can you hear me? Uh, first, I'd like to make a very short statement about the D family and uh, what happened to them. Everybody's been focused so far on the media's misrepresentation of what occurred. Uh, one journalist, quote, journalist in particular, Christine Amanpour, who should be banned from the media for life, um, and what she said, really wasn't extraordinary, because these are the kind of lies that have been perpetrated against us from time immemorial. Um, but what I, I did come away from, uh, with after this horrific event that happened to the D family, was that uh, it wasn't just the Arabs and it wasn't just the media that was responsible for this atrocity. Uh, we were <laughs> responsible for this atrocity as well, all of us. Uh, there's a notion in the Talmud that if you have an opportunity to prevent a tragedy and you don't, you own it. You're, you're equally guilty. And why do I say this? Because we elected a government that was ostensibly dedicated to eliminating the terrorist threat. And they aren't. They're kicking the can down the road just like every other government before them. Left, right, and center. And perhaps most shockingly, it's our own military that's responsible for this disgraceful situation that <laughs> currently exists where you kill a Jew, the city is locked down for maybe a day or two. The roadblocks are taken down for a couple of days. And they remind me of a lot of the prison uh, wardens that I uh, served under uh, who just wanted to end the day without an escape or without an officer being killed. <laughs> Anything else, any mayhem that occurred was tolerable um, unless those two things had occurred. And it's the same thing with the D family. From my perspective, I, I hear what you're saying. Speak up. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I don't completely agree. I think I, I had a lot of apologies from the security forces that they didn't protect my wife and my kids. Um, but I've actually said publicly that I blame CNN more than I blame the terrorists. And to be honest, um, you know, the terrorists had a gun and how did he get a gun? But you know what? Had he been driving down that road and had he had a head-on collision, he could have done the same damage without the guns. So I, I, I understand that. Um, I've fine. had far too many discussions at the Kirya with people who are in positions to stop this and who either can't or won't. I do not excuse <coughs> any of them at all. I've lost too many friends uh, to this kind of laziness and this kind of appeasement and this kind of cowardice. Uh, we say we need uh, judicial reform. We also need military reform. They elect themselves to these positions, and um, I, I know many good men and women who have basically hit that ceiling, and uh, who, if they had occupied a position of, of authority, could have at least tried to prevent these atrocities from happening. I don't give them any any slack at all. <coughs> I hunted terrorists for my career, and I know what needs to be done. We aren't doing it. Well, you know who I am or at least you think you know who I am. Uh, if you read the media, you don't know who I am at all. <coughs> As I was listening to these gentlemen uh, describe the problems with the media, um, I saw myself reflected in all these stories. Because if you believe the media, um, I'm a pretty bad person. And uh, Israel is even worse. I first became aware of the dichotomy between the truth and the media uh, when I became an intelligence officer. And I quit reading the open source press at that point. Because every morning I would get a report of what exactly had happened the day before. And I compared it to the New York Times and the Washington Post and the LA Times. And uh, it was like from another planet. So I quit reading the newspapers. I quit reading Time Magazine. I quit reading everything in the open source. We all know for a long time that the media is influenced by an editor. It's influenced by a publisher. 
and it's also influenced by the type of audience that the editor and the publishers want to appeal to. So in my case, um, there was absolutely no amount of open source, verifiable truth that would sway the media into perhaps reconsidering some of the lies that they were recirculating that had been given to them by either the government or, some, or basically reporters that were being paid by the government to circulate these stories. So all these incidents that you heard from these three gentlemen really played out in my case. Uh, probably one of the most egregious things that happened was, we all know, I think, that it was uh, largely due to Casper Weinberger that I uh, got the sentence I did. And uh, shortly before his death, his memoirs were published. And in it, um, I was absent. So Edward Black, a uh, noted Jewish historian, a friend of mine, uh, he wrote IBM and the Holocaust, um, asked him, why, why is it that I wasn't mentioned in his book? And he said, well, the Pollard case was a relatively minor matter that was made more important than it was. And um, Black just went off on him <laughs> at that point. You know, you submitted a signed sworn affidavit to the court saying just the opposite. And he said, well, I'm telling you it was a minor matter. Okay. So he died shortly thereafter. And we went to all the media establishments and the Justice Department. And uh, the answer we got from everybody was, it's water under the bridge. So you can either perpetrate a lie, or you can just tolerate one. And in my case, it was both. A lot of people you know, think that we can kind of work with the press here, maybe influence them to tell the truth, maybe convince them to see the other side. Well enough. I, I don't believe in this anymore. Um, so what are my suggestions on how to deal with this kind of media problem? First of all, you have to recognize that we're in a state of war. And we've been in a state of war ever since the recreation of our commonwealth. So the issue at that point is there's a different mentality with regard to freedom of speech and freedom of the press that operates in a war zone. And we are in a war zone right now. Don't confuse the banality of life right now with normality. It isn't. So what does that mean? It means we have to view the foreign media. I'm going to stay off our local media because I don't want to get sued. So <laughs> I'll stay off that. Um, as agents of enemy propaganda, and if you read these gentlemen's books and listen to this lecture, I don't have to add anything to that. So what do we do? Well, I've already briefed any number of people that we should close the CNN um, office, we should close the New York Times office, we should close the LA Times office, we for sure should shut Al Jazeera down, and uh, the BBC, and several others. Friends 24. Yeah, and <laughs> no, because I I have no spare toilet paper. If we stop the arts, I don't know what I'd do if we ran out of regular toilet paper and the arts wasn't available. Um, no, I I actually had a libel suit against the arts, and uh, I won and I got one shekel, okay. and they never retracted it publicly. Okay. Did they pay you the one shekel? They gave me one shekel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Esther, I'll let shalom, they gave her. And she threw it back in their face, in court. And they wanted to uh, sue her for assault. <laughs> and uh, she said, if I knew they were going to sue me with assault, I would have thrown something a little bit heavier than one shekel. Had. But that was Esther, I'll let shalom. Um, why do I want to do this? First of all, with the, with the availability of the internet, freedom of speech and your ability to read their garbage is guaranteed. I'm not advocating 
censoring the internet at this point. What I'm doing is I'm advocating removing their privilege of being here and lying about us. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm advocating. Covering Israel is a privilege in, during wartime. And we are in wartime. So by removing these people, I know that uh, Yair Lapid and um, will come out with something interesting that doesn't really have anything to do with life on earth <laughs> and that um, Gantz, after standing around looking dazed, will be handed his talking papers by his media people and he'll be shocked and he'll clutch his uh, pearls and he'll gasp and vapor will come out of him. But the bottom line with these media people is they have to go. And that's all I'm advocating. Now, can they still write trash from, from elsewhere? Yes, of course they can. But at least we have to do something to say that a media organization like CNN that tolerates a witch, an anti-Semitic witch like Christian Amanpour, and someone like Wolf Blitzer. Yeah. You gotta remember the garbage that he did to this country when he was here. Don't say. Mm -hmm. uh, don't say. So when the CNN crew, I mean actually Christina McFarlane was much worse than Christina Amanpour to me. Of course, I mean, so, 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 I mean I'm well aware of that. But, but, but the, 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 when the cameraman came to my house, I said, to, I had a chat with him and I said, where do you live? So he said, I think it's in Tel Aviv. I said, interesting, why, why Tel Aviv? Because my kids go to the international school, were settled, so I, I was too polite to say, why don't you choose to live in Damascus or Tehran or Ramallah? Right. Um, but I have said to all the politicians, by the way, that when they come up with a solution to this reform, which they will in the next week or two, I guarantee, because I have been a little bit involved, and it's going to look a little bit like, you know, democracy, meaning that the right wing, uh, that the government chooses the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the judges in the Supreme Court, because that's what Dershowitz says is democracy and the, the left wing will actually uh, create a bit of human rights but they will carve out <coughs> human rights for terrorists they will not be a, 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 a li liable for human rights and nor will terror jour journalists terror, okay. now terror journalists and, and what, I, what I've suggested to all of them including BB is that you take these guys right when they write these articles you drive them to the border of uh, Syria you open the gate and, and you push go. them through. You say, "Put the gate, push yeah. them through," yeah. and you close the gate behind you. Say, "Have a lovely time." This is, this is you. You touched on something very important. There was a certain Al Jazeera, female Al Jazeera reporter, <coughs> that um, mysteriously died, mm -hmm. and we don't really know what happened. I don't really care. Uh, she was not a journalist. I won't repeat her name. But she was not a journalist. She was an anti-Semitic propagandist. And there was no reason, and I pointed this out to people, for us to tolerate her presence. Uh, I'm not saying that anything physically should have been done to her, except to have ex escorted her, either to the, the border of Syria, or uh, Gaza, or Ben Gurion, and say, goodbye, leave. If you're going to be this kind of, quote, reporter, we don't want you here. This is why it's important for us to understand that, you know, the rule of law, there's an expression in Latin um, that in wartime there is no law. Well, I have another expression as far as the media is concerned. In wartime, we own the media. Because if we don't, they, they write the narrative like there was a shootout. A shootout. Yeah, yeah. Disgusting. Okay. So, I guess in closing, the bottom line is for us to understand that we are in war and that there are certain rules that apply to the media during times of war. We would never, we, my pronouns get mixed up, <laughs> the United States would never have tolerated pro Nazi journalists operating in the United States during World War II. They, they, they did, by the way. Well, they did, but... I, 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 I'm just, I, I, in my, le my letter to uh, David Zaslav, which you'll read on Friday in the Jerusalem Post, I quote the fact that the Warner Brothers, and uh, Sam right. and Abel, these people, were, they, they were the only ones who stood up in the 1930s 
in Hollywood against an anti-fascist rule that was implemented by the Nazi consul to Los Angeles. Right. And there was a rule that basically they were not allowed to make anti-Nazi films. And Warner Brothers were the only ones who stood up to it. So in my letter I say to him, they would be turning in their grave if okay. they knew what you were doing now with CNN. Right. Certainly, during, during the war, yeah. this, this was very different. And, we, and I, I'm just trying to make the point that we are in war yeah. right now. So um, I'm home, I have a mouth, and uh, I'm trying very carefully to um, get people, particularly in the Kyria, to uh, stop putting the can down the road because all the can sees are dead people down the road, our people. So thank you. And how did Darius see and affect the political landscape and is Israel's foreign relations? Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll say that the legacy of Darius seen is a permanent guilt trip on Israel. And, and Darius Sinaizing is exactly what's going on all the time. Very important to know this. Okay? Every child, and, and again, Israel and the donor nations, the 67 donor nations and 33 relief agencies that help UNRWA education. All of them, all of, them, all, all of the UNRWA education is based on the Dere Yassin precedent. And that's very important. And it, 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 we see it happening all the time. And, and children are, are, are raised on the idea of Dere Yassin and Nakba. Operationally, what the media sees that a lie like Dir Yassin is not overturned, or not even uh, confronted, they get their license to do what they're doing right now. So it isn't so much the nature of the lie, but the lie itself that's tolerated, that's, uh, that came from Dir Yassin. So the fact that Professor Tauber finally came out with the truth and it isn't being covered by every major newspaper's book review section, I think tells you enough right there. They don't want to know the truth. They know what the truth is, but they don't want to know it at the same time. I think that's one of the major legacies from Dear Yassin. You can lie and get away with it. First, I tried to publish my book with an American elite university presses, the Ivy League presses, and I approached some of them. And all of them were unanimously convinced that the book was great, was very strong, they believed in what is written there, and it was precisely because of this why the academic committee has decided not to publish the book. To put it simply, they were betraying their profession. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's one of the key points, take home points is that in the 21st century, uh, information professionals, and that's not just journalists, it's academics, it goes right down to librarians, have essentially <coughs> abandoned their professional commitments. They're not informational information professionals, they're information manipulators. And in fact, one of the things, as David said, one of the things I argue in the book is that when the success of the fake news campaign against Israel became really clear, it started to spread. Journalists started to do fake news in all kinds of areas. So for example, at the approach of the second uh, electoral campaign of uh, George Bush, Junior. In 2004, CNN actually produced a fake document that came from his uh, commander in the National Guard saying he was a lazy bum. Um, and it was a fake document, it was discovered as a fake. At the same time, the Lancet Journal, which is one of the oldest and most revered journals in the history of British medicine, came out with cooked statistics on how the Americans had killed, I think, 100,000 people in Iraq. Um, and they came out with it just before the election. 
And at this point, now we have, you know, a press, and I think, unfortunately, it's invaded all sides of this affair. Everybody has become a partisan, and everybody justifies being a partisan because they're compensating for what the other side's doing. Um, the legacy of Deir Yassin is long and very woeful. All right, so yes, exactly. Um, if anyone has any questions specifically about Deir Yassin, particularly for the professor, Professor Tober, uh, uh, we'll be happy to take those questions now. Only? Or other questions later? So yeah, there, there will be other questions. Uh, just more discussion uh, questions? I, and think then I think this is about Deir Yassin. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you use the nomenclature Palestinian. They, the Arab Muslims in 48, right? I don't, do you use it? Or do you, do you, I think you use the word when you're... Uh, I'm using the word Palestinians to make you comfortable with the term. But basically in 1948, no one was calling them Palestinians. They were using the term Palestine, namely Palestine. They were not using the term Palestinians. None at all. They were all called Arabs. That's right. That's my, my, so my question is, why do we perpetuate the lie mm -hmm. that they are an ancient people when the only people who called themselves Palestinians since Hadrian were Christians and Romans, Romans and then later Roman Catholics, and then Christians who invaded the Holy Land during the Crusades, and Jews because we wanted to, we were slavishly, what do we were slavishly, uh, the serving our masters in the Christian world. That's the only reason why we call, the Pal we call ourselves Palestinians. It was a name made up to de-Judaize the land, but the Arabs and the Muslims never called Eretz Israel Palestine. I, you check the Turkish records from the 19th century, they didn't call it So why do we perpetuate, even in our books, by calling these people Palestinians? If you will read my book, as I hope that you will do, you will see that I never use in most of the chapters of the book the term Palestinian, only the term that was then used, namely Arabs. I'm only using the term Palestinians when I'm uh, dealing in one chapter with the, uh, with the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem. When I try to show that basically the Palestinians created their own problem by believing in the massacre that they invented, I need to use the common term of the Palestinian refugee problem, otherwise people uh, might not understand what I'm talking about. So, in order to be reasonable, I must use the term Palestinian refugee problem when I deal with it. However, throughout the rest of the chapters of the book, when I'm dealing with the historical event, then I'm only using the real term that was used, namely Arabs. To the professor. Uh, professor, I, a question. As you explained, you brought your books to a lot of the Western publishers. They said, very nice, but we're not so interested. I'd imagine that that is the reception that it could probably get in most of the Western world. You might be right, Professor, but if this massacre wasn't done, the Jews probably did 10 other massacres. 100 other massacres are doing massacres right now. So the question is, who is our audience. To whom are we speaking? Are we speaking to the West? Are we speaking to ourselves, the Jews? I wrote the book in English in order to approach the West, not to approach Israelis. For the Israelis there is a Hebrew edition published by Kinneret Press. So basically, I mean, you will have this 10% of non-Jews who, who don't need the book because for them there was a massacre and they don't care about the truth. There will also be probably one, uh, 10% of people, non-Jews, who do also don't need the book because they are pro-Israelis. And for them there was no massacre whether there was or was not. But you have also, must admit that you have the 80% in the middle that are not really pro-Jews or pro-Palestinians. And they want to know the truth, if they are interested. So I supply them with the truth. You think and I can tell you that people who are reading the book, non-Jews, and then they are writing uh, comments on Amazon, on the site of Amazon and other places. They are saying, we were convinced. Of course, there are many Arabs who say, don't write the book, everything there is are lies. But they don't even have the ability to pinpoint a lie because they didn't read the book. But everyone who re read the book is saying, 
you are just trying to prevent us from reading the truth. And these are people are non-Jews. Okay. So there is a point to publish that, which is about that such 80, a book. About that 80%, sorry, there's one policy. About the 80%, not that it's an official number. What if that 80% is really the ones who are finished? They say, well, enough of the Jews, enough of Israel. And then who are we approaching? That's my concern. And then not only about the book, but to the entire panel. If the I'll make, it, I'll make it simple. Yeah. If you have a statistical error, there are always some people with integrity, period. period. <laughs> look, look, if you have, if you are having a blood label, you have to refute it. You have to debunk the blood label. I mean, there's no point just saying everything is, 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 right. it is, it is uh, there is no use, there is no point. I mean, you must fight it. And I believe that I'm doing very well with this book. Mm -hmm. I mean, eventually people will get convinced. Maybe slowly, but eventually the book will win. Uh, I just want to make one more remark on that, um, particularly about the blood libel. The title of my book is, Can the Whole World Be Wrong? And it's taken from a quote from um, Echad Am in 1892 in Ukraine when the blood libel was circulating widely. And Jews would say, but we don't eat the blood of Christians in our matzah. And the response was, can everybody be wrong and the Jews be right? And then again at Janine, Kofi Annan, in response to the Israelis denying that there was a massacre, said, he didn't even ask the question, he said, I don't <laughs> think that the whole world, including the friends of Israel, can be wrong and Israel be right. And, and I do think that, I agree, this stuff, it has to be on record. And we have to... I mean, I was stunned when you said you thought 80% of the public was open to hearing this. I don't think it's 80%, but I do think that it's important to convince people that there can be real-life emperor new, Emperor's New Clothes events in which everybody out there in the public is behaving like a fool. Now, how did the Janine massacre thing, how was it put aside? It was put aside when it was, when it was, it was put aside when it was revealed that, that Shimon Perez provided 1.2 million dollars to, to, to uh, Terry Larson to get that Nobel Peace Prize. At exactly that time, that's when they dropped the claim. Okay? Now, that's not something that the Paris Center will, will admit, but the Paris Center did it, and they had an anonymous guy at the Paris Center named Yitzhak Herzog, who facilitated it. I wonder where he is now. Uh, where are they now? Remember Mad Magazine? Anyway, that's what, that's what, what, we, what was accomplished at the time. That's how it was pushed off the agenda. So there's other issues, especially economic issues. If we had, if we had the funds, and we lo we're looking for the funds to investigate every corporation invested in the Palestinian Authority and now invested in Saudi Arabia. Ever hear of normalization? Mm. Let's make some money, guys. Well, yeah. that's what we're trying to deal with to, to neutralize the people who are trying to hurt Israel because they, 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 they think it's a, that we're a nation of prophets with an F rather than a PH. Okay? <laughs> think about oh. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I have a question for the professor. Uh, one of the biggest shocks for me when I was reading your book uh, was to find out that like the the, the citizens of Darisin had a good relationship with their Jewish neighbors and even when uh, other Arabs would come and they wanted to do like training exercises and stuff military exercises um, at least at least to a point of uh, the Arabs of Darisin didn't want them there which uh, for me was a big twist and the, the question I have the question I'm wondering is could the could it have been avoided? Did we have to capture Darius Sin? First of all, the, there wasn't a good relationship between the people of Darius Sin and the Jews. There was an agreement of relationship between the people of Darius Sin and Givat Shaul. This is why usually they wouldn't shoot at Givat Shaul, although at times the brothers of Muhtar and Darius Sin opposed this, and some of them were shooting at Givat Shaul. But Basically, they try to to keep the agreement with Givat Shaul, but not with the other Jewish neighborhoods. To put, just to put the record straight. Now, if you if you are asking me if it was uh, 
if it could be avoided, we know that the Haganah was intending to do the same thing if Etzel Alechi won't do it before it, because they wanted to build up an, a, a runway, a small airfield, where today is Kanfei uh, I mean, Kanfei <laughs> Nesharim is a roller street road because it was once a runway. So you can see from one end of the street to the other end, because it was intended for planes and not for uh, vehicles. But later on it was abandoned and it became a road. But uh, if you are asking me if it could be avoided, I will tell you one thing. And I'm telling you not because of analysis or interpretation, but, but because it was said explicitly by the survivors of the Yasin. Before that day, no one uh, could realize that the Jews were coming in order to stay for good. It was just a hit and run operations. And therefore, when the combatants of Etzel and Lehi came and warned the people of Diriasin to leave the village, they were just saying, telling themselves, it is just another run, uh, uh, hit and run operation. And therefore, there is some logic in order to stay and fight them back in order that they will leave earlier. They didn't realize that they were not going to leave. And if they will fight them, they will fight them back until one of them uh, will win over the other. And because it was exactly the, the first days of national operation when the Jews were starting to occupy our villages for good, the people of Dirasin didn't understand the meaning of the attack. And this was the reason why so many of them were eventually killed. And I'm and, and, and not saying that because I'm analyzing is just statements made explicitly by the survivors of the years in the same we didn't understand it. This is why we decided to remain, to use the weapons that we had in order to fight the Jews. This was our mistake. Hmm. I have a question not about not uh, about Dear so May I ask it? And and just uh and, and it's time, sorry. Okay. okay. So we're gonna we're actually we are gonna move on from Dary Scene. Um, this was discussed by some of the panelists, but for the panelists who didn't discuss it, uh, in your opinion, why does the global media hate Israel so much? I'm going to give a <laughs> short answer. I work with the media about anti-Semitism. I, I don't believe that. It's very. I don't. Believe, I don't see the hatred. I've been working with the. I've been working with the mainstream media for 36 years. I don't see hatred. I see. A pragmatic thing that it's better to do, it's easier to do business with these guys, they're smarter, but again, it's not a matter of hatred, they, they basically have worked different ways to work successfully with the foreign, again, Israel does nothing to balance, to, to, and to, where we live in Judea Samaria, we can't get anyone to take, the, and this used to be, used to be able to take journalists on trips, they refuse to do it. They, if they, they want to, uh, I'm having this argument with Kiryat Arba, with Gush Etzion, with the Moetzit Pesha, and all these other people that they do not want. They do not want to extend themselves to the media. Therefore, who has the who has the air, who has the um, uh, takes the lead? Huh, the people who hate us. So if you have one side presenting their their, their case to the media, the other side the other side not presenting their case to the media, who's going to win? And the and and the the, the uh, also oh. The brain, the, the brain dead people in the Ministry of, of Tourism, you should know, no longer give out maps. Everyone can find it. So what do the Arabs do? I, I'm telling you, this is correspondence I've had with, 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 the, uh, with, this, with the spokesman of the Minister of Tourism. So what do the Arabs do? Huh, they've increased their the distribution of their maps, which this, and, I, and look at this thing we've just put out here about no, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the maps put out by the PA. And that this is what's given to the foreign press, because Israel won't give them maps anymore. Hello, we have many brain dead people, and I, I always said yes. that the best way to understand Israel is to read Mad Magazine over and over. <laughs> well, we used to say that you can't make these things up. Hello. Anyway, if one side is presenting and the other side is not, also in terms of our fa the families of loved ones who have been murdered, I, I need help to find them and bring them in front of the media. And the media can't can't deny it. But what, is, what do the Arabs do, since we're not doing it? The Arabs do their, their whole thing of, of, um, of, of Arabs who have been killed by Jews. Can be and I'm telling you... Right. There's there's the, the, yeah. David, I... I have to disagree with you there. I, I, I mean, you have this 
idea that if we just gave the media the good information, they'd go for it. And I think that... I didn't say that. Well, you implied it, you know, that if we put out those maps, and if we try, do, if and if try, we reach, and if we bring, and so on. And I, I think there is something much deeper here that's both the intimidation and also their perception, like the New York Times, that they have an audience that wants this right. stuff. Right. You know, and so I think that, I mean, <coughs> if we're going to be able to make a difference, the two key messages, it seems to me, is that <coughs> this stuff is poison. Mm -hmm. And you are, you as journalists are poisoning the people who consume your product, and the consumers are poisoning themselves. And I don't think that until that's understood, you know, you, you said, uh, uh, Jonathan, Esav uh, Yaakov, um, it's true, but it's not, it's not, <laughs> the the argument in Latin was in times of war the law is silent. Well, unfortunately, uh, a, a variation of that in times of war the truth is twisted. It's not that it's silent; it's twisted. Right. I don't personally. I don't believe we should tolerate any of these people here, and I think that um, we have to understand that in in a war scenario or in a war environment, a military environment, these guys should not even be allowed in the country at all. I mean, we can chase after them, we can shower them with the truth, we can talk to them till we're blue in the face. It isn't going to change that because their consumers want it. The people that they're serving want it. And because of that, my, I'm sorry, I'm just of a mind right now, get rid of them all. But Every single one of them. But how do we do that? You, you don't <laughs> allow them to come. Okay, but, they, but meanwhile, while they're here, there's something called the JCS, the Jerusalem Capital Studios. I'd like to see vigils in front of the JCS when there are when there are very egregious mistakes made. I need ten people to demonstrate against CNN, to demonstrate against AP. AP. I'd also like to see demonstrations against the ger the biggest funders of of. Um, PLO violence right now is Germany. I'd like wow. to see a... a That's I need why you have the NGO law, well, okay. which BB just gave. Well, okay, but Senator, but again, yes. with or without law, we need... A problem is a problem when someone makes it into a problem. I need 10 people, if they want to work with me, 10 people who will, who will conduct a, a weekly vigil against the, 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 the German consulate and, and the American government, the American ambassador designate, maybe Susie Gelman. Now, if we have that as the case, I love, and if you saw that anyone who wants to see what I've been writing about Nides, the Nides of March, with the problem of Nides, <laughs> the, yeah. the American ambassador, look at the things he refu he refuses, acts, he condemns terrorism, and he, he condemns slave, Bay for Slave, but he will not ask the PA to cancel their law that if you murder a Jew, you get a life, life in prison. I need I, I leave a life and salary. I need 10 people. You want to make me make a headline? Ten people standing in front of the American embassy once a week, or make, in, in front of the, the home of the American ambassador, which is on. Um, we we did that in my case. We had right. hundreds right. of people. Right. They, they don't care. Do you, you want to nicely respond people. to that? Well, yeah. Peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's enough with the demonstrations. It's enough with ten people or twenty people, or in my case, hundreds or thousands of people. The only thing they understand is a firm hand. That's it. You know what? And as far as Nides is concerned, the, here's an example. The Likud has to understand, the Central Committee has to understand, that unless they start growing up and not accepting people like animals, and I call him an animal, like Nides, as a, an ambassador to no. Israel, <laughs> that you don't vote for the Likud. That unless you start finishing Janine rather than tolerating Janine, we're not voting for you. You can talk to people from Yoham and Netivot and, and Sterot and say, you know, a definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, except expecting a different outcome. Okay, don't complain to me. Who did you vote for over the past 10 years? Who did you vote for? You voted for the same people who tolerate the rockets, 
the uh, mortar shells, the terrorists, and the balloons. Don't come to me crying that your kids, you know, are wetting the bed because they're waiting for the next round. You empowered the government that tolerates that, just like we've empowered the government and the military that allow these wretched, wretched people from the media into this country. Well, okay, you made your point. Uh, Professor Landis, well, yes. I have a question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a, a question. First, a comment, if you'll yeah. permit, permit, permit me a comment. Um, you said that you thought that the roots of the, what's happening has to do with supersession. In other words, between I'll repeat. between Christianity and, and Judaism, and, and I don't right. doubt that, that that's still playing itself out. But don't you think deep down that the whole world would like to see Israel acting like the Nazis, and they can feel like really good about World mm -hmm. War II, because when we get the power, see what they do, right. and if we have to create lies to, cr to get right. that message across, right. we guilt. will. It's the and guilt. I don't know if the world feels any con lack of yeah. conscience, but that right. was the comment. The question, the, the, the question to you, you know, you're bemoaning the lethal journey of journalism of, of the whole world. Right. How about here in Israel? Oh, it breaks this. my heart. <laughs> How about it. here in Israel, the self-hating, the self-doubt, the self-hating that is communicated through so much of the media? Okay. In other words, for example, you listen to the news. What's the reason for a certain killing, knifing, pigua? Uh, uh, to revenge against no, blah, blah, blah. Le Umani. No. Le Umani. It was national. That does that give... What? It was hate. Okay, okay. What's your question? All right. And the question was, what about the local, local oh, media? Yeah. So the the first was a comment about supersessionism, and I, I do want to comment on it. Um, <coughs> I'm about to come out with an article in the fall 2023 <coughs> issue of the Journal of Anti-Semitism on the supersessionism question. And one of the things that I'm doing in it is making this argument that supersessionism is a psychological problem. And that in order to feel good about yourself, you yeah. need to sit on the Jews. Yeah, and make them look um, like Nazis. Right. Possibly. And so one of the things that we medievalists know is that the more insecure Christians are about their faith, the more they come down on us. So when there's a crisis about transubstantiation, which I am not going to explain, <laughs> um, when there's a crisis about transubstantiation, you end up getting Jews targeted as a way of reinforcing this failing faith. So, so the so the 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 Holocaust inversion, as Manfred Gerstenfeld and many others refer to it as um, this, the, the Jews of the new Nazis, the mm -hmm. Palestinians of the new Jews, mm -hmm. um, reflects, I think, a profound insecurity mm -hmm. on the part of the progressive left. Now, your question about local press, I mean, obviously, you're thinking a lot about Haaretz, not only. Um, not, not only. only. Not only. The last idiot. Not only. Look at the Jerusalem Post, the coverage of the last election. The last idiot. Okay, so, um... Idiot top one up. Right, so... So, um, I do have a chapter in the book called Jews Against Themselves. Um, and I, I think a lot about this question of Jewish self-criticism. Right now, I'm in a discussion with Glenn Lowry about having uh, Norman Finkelstein on his program. Uh, yeah, Oive is right. And um, so the point is that there really is a peculiarly Jewish, it's like, um, you know, it, it's self criticism is, for me, one of the most important values that Jews have, and you can see it. In the biblical account, it's 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 the secret to our success, but it also produces pathological forms. And my feeling is, you'll never get to the the, the pathology or those who have that uh, pathology. What you have to do is get to their audience. What you have to do is say to Gentiles, like Glenn Lowry, this may sound good to you, but it's poison, and you're not helping yourself by devouring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we're going to do a last panel uh, discussion question, and then we'll take some questions, and we'll wrap up. Yeah. Uh, last question, pretty standard. 
Uh, as everyone knows here, the UN disproportionately targets Israel uh, to almost a comical effect. Oh, a Sometimes you read headlines and you think that it's satire, but it's real. Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Why, why is the UN this way towards Israel? And why only Israel? Let me say something. I've been at the UN press club seven times. And each time we've succeeded to get good headlines coming out of the UN. It doesn't mean that we won the war. But again, one side is making one one side makes their vo voice heard, the other side is, sh is is silent. Yeah, we're not gonna win the big war, but we're only gonna win incrementally. I'm not naive and I don't want the job and anyone else to think we're naive. But again, one side grabs it, grabs the, the, the mic and the other side doesn't. That's part of the issue. Okay. Yeah, the UN press the UN press club is open to have anyone there, and it will produce some headlines. Why? But why? Why is it like that? What? Why is it like that? Well, because Jews, the, 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 when you have a people, basically don't want to be where they don't want to be, where where not, not, they're not welcome. That's part of the issue. In other words, I I don't mind getting abuse. All right, well, it's okay. You know. I, my, 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 my dog likes me, my cat likes me, <laughs> but it's okay, yeah. but I'm saying that, that the, most people don't want to be where, where, it, where it's uncomfortable. True. That's it, that's it, and so I'm just saying that if we have the opportunity, we have, and we should do it, and, and there's people I have seen in the, in the 36 years I've been in the field, many people, not thousands, I've seen many people turn, turn their, uh, their, their, their opinions, uh, and um, I've seen them turn around. Okay. It's not thousands of people. So I, I think that what we're dealing with with the UN is a um, democracy in which all the voters are from dictatorships. <laughs> and essentially that Israel is the natural leader of the fourth world the fourth world being all those people who were oppressed by the imperialist tendencies of the third world. The Bedouins, the Kurds, the Tibetans, Berbers. the Ukrainians, the Berbers. And as a result, the hostility at the UN is largely from this block of dictatorships, an awareness that we represent a very dangerous and subversive presence in the world community and I would say that's probably why throughout the history of authoritarian regimes which includes the Middle Ages which I study that has been the reason why the Jews are viewed with so much uh, fear it's not it's not really anti-semitism it's Judeophobia it's a fear of the Jews if, if I could uh, just drop a point that I've been trying to make for, for since I came home. Why are we even in the UN? I don't like being in places that I'm not wanted. <laughs> to quote David Bedin. <laughs> to quote David Bedin. <laughs> right. Where do you think I got it? Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I think if you could just imagine a situation in which you don't have to see UN personnel and UN vehicles uh, traveling around Yerushalayim or the territories or anywhere else and where we aren't sitting as a punching bag or as a venue for people that certain prime ministers fear as competitors uh, so they banish them to the United Nations I really think that um, it's time to leave it's time to leave <coughs> He sneezed on the truth. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so before we take general questions, um, this is an important message in general from the store. Uh, we brought together four speakers who spoke about topics that often get silenced, um, and th these are viewpoints that often get silenced. And in the bookstore, our main uh, purpose is to spread Torah and spread reading, and everyone has all kinds of viewpoints and uh, it's important to have conversation, peaceful conversation. Um, the panelists have been very expressive. Is there anyone who, if anyone felt something they really disagreed with, they want to bring that up, have a conversation in question form and they'll answer it? Um, we're happy to hear that now. <coughs> okay. Um, 
and whichever one. <coughs> so this is this is most oh, this is primarily a puzzle for Unitan, but um, I suppose for all. Unitan, you said something about the uh, need for military reform. And uh, I'm curious if you believe that Herzl Levy and the fact that he um, both stated outright that Israel doesn't need America, his appointment of David Zini uh, to be a general, uh, and other such actions, do you think that this is an improvement or do you think it's just business as usual? Me? Yeah. Nothing's changed. Hmm. Well, what do you think about the Israel weaning itself from America? One of the best things that Bibi ever said, apart from welcome home to me, <laughs> was when he, he gave his first speech before a joint session of yes, Congress. Yes, right before Purim. Correct. Tommy and Duster. this was the first one. And one of the things that he proposed at the time was that we drop the addiction we have to American military's mm -hmm. uh, subsidies mm -hmm. and that we enter into joint R&D. Mm -hmm. He also said we should get rid of the economic assistance, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. But it's the dropping of the, of the reliance on American weapons and that whole policy has been designed to gut our own industry here, mm -hmm. to destroy our own industry. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if, if you listen to Bibi's logic in that first speech he gave, it applies even more so today. And of course, he's dropped it for any number of reasons, but the reliance upon the United States has been the worst thing that has ever happened to this country. Has become it, the worst that thing. That has become the worst well, thing that has like ever happened to this money. country. Will it be fighter jet? Pardon? Will it be fighter jet? That is a scandal that um, I, I, I've talked to Moshe Ahrens about this, and he becomes apoplectic. He can't even get the story out of his mouth without turning red. Mm -hmm. We killed ourselves with, with that project. We had the opportunity to be a world exporter of one of the finest fighter bombers that ever, ever was created. And we walked away from it for a number of very bad reasons. Okay. And with the right-wing government, why hasn't BB followed through, at least in part? Why? Because he's, he's BB. No, because he's BB. He's BB speech. always existed in a government where he was the fulcrum, and there was a left wing and a right wing. Well, he's the left wing now, so <laughs> you're not going <laughs> to get anything <laughs> out of him. I'm sorry. Ne next question. He speaks like Churchill, but behaves like Chamberlain. Ne next question. Don't insult Chamberlain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're all Torah observant Jews here, I think, or for the most part, at mm -hmm. least. Uh, Believers, how do we bring God into the picture here? God, mm -hmm. I lived for 30 years because of Yerat Shemayim. Okay, so how do we apply that to we do it politics every day. and <laughs> in our writings day we're and yeah, exactly we do it every day we're here. But but let but it's, me, that seems to be silent. One, one it's personal. How do we make that public? One practical suggestion: if 10 people. Ten people were to demand in front of the Jerusalem Capital Studios, 206 Jaffa, one, a, 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 a vigil on the issue of demanding that the PA repeal their law, the unprecedented law that if you murder a Jew, you get a salary for life. Not one newspaper has pushed it. Not, I, I wrote to every member of Knesset. Nobody wants to, wants to touch it. That is the kind of thing that we. That is the ultimate chilul Hashem that we live with every day. I can't live with myself when that's going on. And so 10 people in front of the Jerusalem Capital Studios where 30, 32 media outlets will see it, okay. and maybe someone will, will pick up, if right. one person picks up on it, we, we, we'll, get, we'll get, get somewhere. There's a list of Hilal well, yeah, 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 a long, long, list. long list. Richard, how, how can we bring God into a... Uh, into, uh, into I, I agree with Jonathan. You just, the, the very fact that we're here and thriving yeah. under these incredible conditions is a testimony to yeah. The presence of Hashem in our lives. Uh, the one, just one other point about. No, go ahead. Let's go to questions. Yes. I have a very short question to Professor Tauber. Uh, I do understand your theme is Dave Yassin and its implications, but I've read that 
there were calls uh, of Arabian leaders to Arabs of Palestine to leave for two weeks just for them to use artillery and aviation and they flee. So can you compare, uh, I do understand that it's a difficult thing, compare the numbers of uh, fleeing after Dei Rasin and those fleeing because of the calls of the Arab leaders? There are no solid proofs for the story that there were calls for Arab, Arab leaders to leave. On the contrary, Abdallah, king of Transjordan, explicitly asked them to stop leaving and coming to Transjordan. So basically, I don't think that this story, I mean, this story was a story of the Israeli Asbara, but I don't believe it actually happened in practice. About what happened after the Yasin, I know, I don't have to think, I know that it happened in practice. You speak of supersessionism as um, the cause, the root cause of the anti-Semitism. Where does Islam fit into that? Because supersessionism is mainly a Christian problem. No, no, no. They have their, they have their own version. Yeah. They have their own version, and the laws of the Vimy are specifically, we are big because you are small. You live in disgrace. You cannot give testimony but in court. Any non-Muslim is dealing with not just. That's right. That's right. No, so, no. But the, Some are killed. Yeah. No. The the yeah. Like the no. Really. March really. I mean, tomorrow. the whole point of that Vimy when when the Muslim and their um, allies in academia, the apologists for Islam, talk about the laws of the Vimy. They talk about um, that it's protected. Protected from what? Protected from Muslim violence. So that you, and the point is that there's no question that Islam, it doesn't have the formal supersessionist theology of the Christians, but they believe that in their version, they don't, see, they don't come after us and sit on top of us. They were there from the very start and we, we actually falsified the Bible. So essentially it's the same thing. And it's, it's a form of triumphal, I call it triumphalist religiosity. And that is, you only feel that you have the true religion if it is visibly superior to the others. And if you're not visibly superior, you're, you have doubts. The only proof is, we won and therefore we're right. Okay, so we're going to take one more question from the audience, and then if you still have questions, you can feel free to line up, whatever. But uh, yeah. Professor Hirsch talks about this imperial triumphalist yeah, yeah. nature yeah. of this one. All right, so last question from the audience. Okay, I have a vested interest. I'll tell you why. We all do. Well, you'll listen and then you'll understand. I was supposed to be the material controller for the lobby. What? For? For the lobby, F. The lobby fighter, okay? So, what Jonathan has said about Moshe Ahrens and what went on, it was dirty business all the way through. But that wasn't, I was just making that point. For 75 years, this country has existed. Prior to the existence of Israel, we had Zionist organizations around the world who pushed out Hasbara so that we had a Jewish state. What did the government of Israel do in the last 75 years in terms of Hasbara? Absolutely nothing. I sat in the office of David Barin Lam when he was director of communications for somebody called B. Netanyahu. He turned around and said to me, straight, we have no money because the previous <coughs> prime minister called Shibon Peres decided to spend any money we had for Hasbara, which was virtually nothing. So where do we end up? We end up with a situation that we have a government that doesn't su support and defend our country in the media and the world press and everything else. I'll go a bit further than that. Every person who's a journalist in this country has to cover, carry a government press card issued by the government press office. Now when you look at it, we have 
journalists from Al Jazeera reporting at Shah Shechem last year when there were riots. Where does a journalist from Al Jazeera get a government press card? Mm -hmm. If he doesn't have a government press card, why did the police let him stand there agitating all the people in Shah Shechem to riot? So we have our problem is twofold. One is there's no Hasbara, and secondly, we have a bunch of idiots in the government press office who do absolutely nothing. So when that, when, let, let me finish. When Danny Seaman was in the government press office, yes. and there was the riots about opening the tunnel, yes. I was sitting in his office, listening to a journalist getting on the phone to him and saying, I don't understand where it is. So he turned around and said to him, well, pick yourself up, it's a mile away, and go and look for yourself. Don't get on to me. We also have pe had people at the time, next to the, next to the Jerusalem um, centre that you, David was talking about, were sitting there asking spokesmen, and I happened to hear another spokesman turn around and apologising for what we were opening the tunnel. Now, if this is not a failure of the government of Israel, we don't pride ourselves, we are the start-up nation, we're not a start-up nation, we're a bunch of idiots for sitting and letting the government of Israel not do anything. Jonathan is 100% right in what he said. And unless people listen to what he has to say and do anything about it, that's the point. It's no point in sitting there and saying, yes, 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 and not doing anything. Is there a question? <laughs> there is a question. At the end of the day... I, I, I just want to make... Let one, I'll Jonathan one, ask the question. clear about that. Uh, somebody asked me, why don't I run for the Knesset? And I answered him by saying I suffered enough. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need a proper government press office, a government spokesman that turns around and says facts. Not Lockheed says one thing, Gunn says another, Gullant says another, Bibby says another. They're all fighting with each other. And that's their business. But in terms of unity, and I don't like using the word unity because I think it's a bit dirty. But in terms of bidding together, we, we have to do something to ensure that the government speaks on our behalf to the world. And, and the only way to do that is to suppress, as Jonathan's pointed out, anybody who comes here, like the press of CNN, BBC, etc. I've been dealing with the BBC for over 50 years. And I know what they're like. And they don't like to be told that you're wrong. I have cases going now with the BBC about it. So why, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to let the government just carry on playing the game? Or, we, or would you suggest instead we do something? Thank you. Professor Tober is going to leave in like two or three minutes. If anyone wants so Massacre That Never Was, now is the time. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.